strengthening the believer, what you and I can do to strengthen our walk with our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and how you and I can, what we can do to be stronger believers all in all. Uh, it, it's important that we do that. You know, um, a lot of times we do just the opposite of what we need to do to get stronger, and then we wonder why we feel so weak as a Christian. Uh, so the number one thing we, the first week we said, and it's the number one thing as far as I'm concerned, is that we can get into the Word of God. Getting into the Word of God is really important. So as you and I take in the Word of God, it strengthens us. So what can I do to be a stronger believer? Take in the Word of God and anything and everything that tries to get you to not come to church and hear the Word of God or to try not to get you to turn in a cassette or a CD or your, your iPhone or whatever it is when you're going to work and listening to the Word, whatever it is that try to stop you from reading the Word of God, please know that it's trying to work against you so you'll be weak. You'll get stronger as you get into the Word of God. One of the things the, the Bible itself, the Word of God says, the apostles used by Almighty God to write this in the Scriptures, and he said that we need to take on the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God. That means there's different parts to the armor of God. And he says so you and I can can, can uh, stand against the wiles or the military strategies of the devil. So the devil has these military strategies that he uses against the family of God. And they're not all that different. Uh, they, he uses them in the first century, the second century. He uses them this century. And they're the same kind of uh, attacks that he tries to use back then and he tries to use now. And he attacks us. They're almost like fiery darts when they get through. They, they burn you and they hurt you. And sometimes you're, you're trying to deal with it for days. And the Word of God says part of the armor of God is called a shield. In the military back then, the Romans had a shield that was pretty big. And it would stop uh, the spears and swords that would try to come against the, 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 the uh, warrior. And he would use the shield to stop things from getting to him. It would hit the shield, but it wouldn't get to him. So a, a great attack would come and, and try to hit him, and the shield would come up and it would stop that. And so the Bible says that we should take the shield of faith, and that's pretty interesting, the shield of faith, uh, which will quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. So every attack Satan sends our way, the fiery dart will try to get into our hearts and burn our minds and hurt us and, and do damage to our faith and make us... He says you need the shield of faith. And again... The way to get the shield of faith is by the Word of God. So that's why we believe a strengthening in ourselves as a believer, a one of the big, big ways is the Word of God because it builds the shield of faith and you're able to resist the fiery darts. And actually it says it quenches all the fiery darts of the evil one. So when we're not getting into the Word, uh, the fiery darts can get through. When we're not listening to the Word, the fiery darts can get through. When you and I recoil or pull back for a while, the fiery darts can get into us. So, you know, we've all gone through that. We're all saying we, we're not wanting to read the Word of God for a couple of days or a couple of hours or some couple of months. Uh, but know this, that's the attack because he knows if he can get us to drop that, not read the Word of God, our faith shield is not as strong and then he sends a fiery dart our way. So the Word of God is important. So we talked about that. I know we're, we're talking about a little bit more today. The Word of God is a way that we can strengthen ourselves as believers, and we need to read the Word of God. Amen? And that's why I say to, to everyone here, when, when I'm preaching, if I'm preaching something other than, other than the Word of God, I give you the okay. If I preach a whole sermon that has nothing to do with the Word of God, you can stand up, stand on the chair, say, preach the Word of God, boy, preach the Word of God. Okay? Now, if you're young, you can say, preach the Word of God, you old man. Whatever you want to do, just preach the Word of God. Amen? The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, his spiritual son, he said, uh, preach the word in season and out of season. There'll be times people won't want, will not want to hear certain things, but you still preach the word of God. Uh, sometimes you're hurt. You're going through a, a disappointment. And the preacher will get up and preach the word of God, and you'll say, wait a minute, that doesn't coincide with my experience. That's still the preacher's job, is to preach the word of God. Amen. Okay, so then this prayer. Uh, how, how do we strengthen ourselves? The Word of God. Then also prayer. Prayer is important. We see Jesus Christ, before he uh, was tempted of the devil, he went into the wilderness and he, he fasted for 40 days, 40 nights, but also says he prayed. So we understand that Jesus, who knew the Word, studied. It says when he was a young boy, his parents had left him and, 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 and took off and then realized he wasn't with him, went back to Jerusalem, found him in the temple studying the Word of God. 
And now we see Jesus before he was tempted of the devil. Uh, 40 days, 40 nights, he fasted and he was alone and, and he was praying to God. So he knew that he was going to be tempted of the devil. He knew the deal. He knew what was going to happen and he knew what he wanted to do to get ready was pray. So if Jesus knew he needed to pray to be strong so when Satan came and tempted him that he wouldn't fall into the traps of the devil, then you and I as followers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and Christian simply means Christ-like or, or a follower, a disciple of Jesus. So if Jesus knew that he needed to pray to stay strong so when Satan came in the wilderness that he wouldn't fall, uh, we ought to know we need to pray. And just to make sure we know what we're talking about right now and just not putting one and one together and coming up with five, Jesus said to his apostles when they were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they were getting ready. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He said, can't you pray with me about one hour? He said, pray with me so you do not fall into temptation. So prayer is important. Amen? Amen. See, Jesus knew it clear back in the wilderness. He knew it in the Garden of Gethsemane. So prayer is important. And we said prayer will strengthen us. There's been times in Christianity, in the Christian uh, world, that people come out and say, you don't need to pray. You just need to proclaim. Uh, proclaiming is important. I think you should. You should, you should proclaim things uh, without a doubt. You should do that. That's part of your confession. Without a doubt, you should do that. But if anyone ever tells you you ought not pray, uh, please uh, go back to the Bible and you'll see the Bible tells you in the New Testament over and over how they prayed and how we should uh, pray without ceasing. Amen? So prayer gives you strength. A confession is another thing that strengthens us as a believer. Confession, uh, confessing your faith in Jesus Christ. There's something about confessing your faith in Jesus Christ that actually makes you stronger. Uh, Gary, Karen, if you'd please stand. This is a great couple, uh, Gary Kathan and Karen Kathan. I actually was in, uh, stood up in their wedding. Uh, I didn't do their wedding. I, I wasn't pastor at that time, uh, but I was actually uh, honored because Gary asked me to be there. And I was nice and close. And when they looked at each other, they said things like this. They said, I take you now, Karen, to be my wife. And she looked at him and she said, I take you now to be my husband. And they, and they talked about it. They talked about how they're taking each other. It was a confession. They were confessing to each other that, you know, I, I leave my mother and my father and I cleave only to you. And she said it to him. I leave my father and mother and I cleave only to you. It was a confession. And now every so often, um, Gary, I'm sure we'll look at Karen and I'm going to let you say it today and say, I love you. I want you to say it real loud to Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you hear that all the time at home, I'm sure, don't you? Yeah. And Karen, why don't you turn, I want you to turn to him. Now, I'm serious. Now, now watch. Could you just turn to her, him and just say you love him? And you say you're, you're my husband? And you say you're my wife? Now listen. Now, now you think that uh, it, it's kind of silly, but it's not silly because this is what happens. When he tells her that he loves her, it strengthens their relationship on her part and his part. And when he says, you're the woman in my life, it strengthens him and it strengthens her. It strengthens their relationship. And when she looks at him and says, you're my man, you're my husband, it strengthens their relationship because they say it to each other. That's a type of a confession. They're confessing to each other, you're my wife, you're my husband. Amen? Amen. So it's not always I confess you know, that I'm healed, I confess that I'm whole, I confess. Of course those are confessions. But sometimes I confess I'm a child of God. I confess that God is my Father. And it makes you a stronger Christian. Thank you, Gary and Karen. God bless you very much. Uh, so we say confession is important. Not just confessing some of the confessions that we may think of right away, but confessing, Father, I thank you that you are my Father. I thank you that I am your child. I thank you you allowed me into your family. I thank you that my mind's been renewed. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love me. And God, I love you. Those kind of confessions are big. And then we said giving. A giving is something that people don't realize, but it's pretty clear in the Bible that when you and I give, uh, we get strengthened as a believer. Uh, where your finances are, your heart's going to be. And where your heart is, your finances should go. And so what we find out is, that it, is when you start giving to God, your heart falls more and more in love with God. You, you have more of an interest in God because you are investing more and more in the kingdom of God. And so your giving opens the door for more blessings in your life. It strengthens you, not just... Um, you give and it's given back to you, uh, pressed down, chicken together, running over uh, finances and things like that, which the Bible does say that. 
But also, it's, what it's really saying to you is, it's also saying to you is that you have a stronger relationship with God because you're investing into God. Amen? He's invested into you, and now when you give back to Him, you're investing into God. And then we said service. A Christian service is a great thing. When you uh, are a Christian and you decide, I'm going to be an usher, a children's worker, I'm going to uh, go ahead and volunteer to be in charge of this ministry or that ministry, or this other person's in charge, I'm going to come up alongside and lift up our, their arms. Uh, when you do that, now, now this is why the devil tries to talk us out of it, because he knows if we're committed to it, we'll get stronger. Because Christian service, when we do Christian service, we actually get stronger. We get better. We get, we get stronger and stronger and stronger. And the devil knows that. So again, the Word of God, prayer, confession, we've talked about giving, and then Christian service. All these things help us become stronger as believers. Now the one today is one that some would think that maybe I should have started with, but I don't think so. I think the Word of God is where you always start. Because faith, you need to know how to pray. The Bible tells you how to pray. You need to, you need to know what to confess. The Bible tells you what to confess. You need to know about giving. The Word of God tells you about giving. So all those things uh, go right along with it. You need to know, do I have a place in the family of God? And God says that you can be an eye, you can be an ear, you can be a foot, you can be a toe. Of course, you, I have a place for you. So the Word of God is number one. We need to know that. So some would say this, this should be number one, and that is this. Witnessing will strengthen us. When you and I witness to other individuals about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it strengthens us as believers. There's something about witnessing to other people about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that strengthens us. And there's something about when we do not witness for Jesus, it actually can have a, the opposite effect. It can actually uh, start to weaken you. So if you feel a little weakened as a Christian, ask yourself, when's the last time that I truthfully and honestly talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. Not in the church, but when did I ever witness to anyone at all? Like, when is the last time? And you'll find yourself possibly looking and saying, you know what, there's an area that I want to uh, spruce up. That's an area that I want to get better at. Uh, I, I'm around a lot of pastors, and we go out to dinner on, on our pastor's uh, uh, Tuesdays. We get together on Tuesdays, and uh, I don't always go with them to eat because a lot of times we, it's too late. We have prayer time and we have visiting time and then they want to go, want to go out to eat by that time it's four o'clock in the afternoon and i'm going it's too late for me uh sometimes but a lot of times we get to go out and eat and i love it when i see pastors not showing off you know some people just show off how they witness because you're there but it's just so natural some of them i watched them and how easy it is with the waitress i don't know how many waitresses we got saved uh over the years that we we wait you know we there used to be a, a place over in uh park ridge uh, Jason's Deli. Some of you have heard of Jason's Deli. We were there and uh, the pastors, there, I don't know, there were about 15 of us were sitting at a table and these guys came in They looked, and, and my, my wife was, knew the manager of the place and so, so because of her we had called ahead and so I knew who he was only because of my wife. People in Park Ridge know her, they don't know me. But, but they walked over, he walked over to the table to see how things were going. I said they're going really good. And he introduced the two people he was with. The two people he was with were the co-owners of Jason's Deli around the world, around the country. Uh, and so he introduced them to us, and all of a sudden, one of the pastors said, started talking to him about the Lord. And both of them said, we believe in the Lord. In fact, that's one of our missions. And uh, we, he asked him, says, is there anything you want us to pray for? And all of a sudden, this older gentleman got tears in his eyes. He said, you guys are willing to pray for me? He said, yeah, well, what is it you have, you have prayer need for? And he talked about his son who had gone through some issues. And I, I don't want to divulge those issues because that's, I just told you who the man is. And so we sat there in, in Jason's deli and, and prayed about that. And then, and then my pastor friend said, uh, I know you said you're a believer, but let me just remind you what the Word of God says. It says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, so why don't we just pray that? And so we sat there in, in the Jason's Deli, all of us praying the prayer of salvation. And I said afterwards, would I, have done, would I have done that alone? And I got more determined to be a witness for our Lord and Savior Jesus. Because I walked out of there strong. So witnessing is a thing that will make you very strong. Witnessing should be the heartbeat of every believer. We should have that more important to us than all the other stuff that we even think of. 
Jesus said that you and I are supposed to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all the other parts of the world, Samaria, and all the other parts of the world. He even wants us to the remotest part of the world he wants us to be a witness to. And you better believe I, I, I witness now more uh, because I, I realize people are going to hell all around us. Um, we, we need to witness to all those around us. Jesus Christ, when you study Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus studied the Word, so we should study the Word. Jesus prayed, so we ought to pray. Jesus would say the right things. We ought to make sure we say the right things. Jesus was a giver, gave his life. Jesus served. Remember, he, he washed the feet of his disciples. But Jesus also was a soul winner. Jesus was a soul winner. As a matter of fact, he came to this earth to save sinners. Jesus is a soul winner. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, This is a faithful saying. This is the Apostle Paul writing this to his spiritual son, Timothy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all uh, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then the Apostle Paul says, whom I am chief. He says, I'm chief sinner. I used to uh, lock up Christians. I used to take them and get them killed. I used to imprison them. I used to go into synagogues and grab them, pull them out and separate families. And he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus was a soul winner. Jesus' mission to come to this earth was to save us, to bring us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And that should be our witness. That should be our job. Amen? Amen. He came to seek and to save those which were lost. Jesus Christ is a soul winner. He came into this world to seek and to save those that are lost. In Luke chapter 19, and verse 10, it says, for the Son of Man, that would be Jesus Christ, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You were lost. I was lost. Those around you were lost. Your mommy and your daddy were lost. Your children were lost. Every one of us were lost. All of us were going to hell. And some say hell in a handbasket. Some say you're going to hell in a bobsled. The idea is that you're going to hell. Jesus came to save those of us that were lost. And everyone has, does not, who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're lost. Jesus knew praying was important. Jesus knew that confession was important. Jesus knew that giving was important. Jesus knew all that. He knew the Word was important. But He came with a mission. He knew saving people would strengthen us. Witnessing for Jesus Christ has a way of strengthening you. Uh, anytime I've ever witnessed for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I always feel better afterwards. I always feel stronger. I, I always feel elated. I always feel excited. I, I feel stronger as a Christian because I was used of the Lord to witness some, to somebody about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful time. And you know, some of us think we have to have a perfect life to be able to witness to somebody about Jesus. I have to have all the money in the world. I have to have everything in the world. I have to have the perfect marriage. I have to... You have to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and witness for Him. That's what you got to do. Amen? Amen. Uh, you'll get blessed. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying don't just talk about Jesus. People are looking for a Savior. In James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, um, But be ye doers. Everybody say doer. Now, this is important. Be ye a doer. In other words, if, if the Bible says reading the Word of God is important, you ought to be a doer of the Word. The Word of God says walking in love. Walking in love is important. Then we ought to walk in love. It amazes me as a pastor. I've been pastoring now for quite a few years. I talk about forgiveness and walking in love, and people in church still don't do it. I, I don't get it. But I, I just don't. I don't understand that. But be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. In other words, you could... You could hear about how important it is for us to gather together and to meet. The Bible says, don't forsake the gathering together, as a manner of some are. Uh, but people hear that, and they still do that. I don't understand why. That. Be a doer of the word. Say doer. doer. The Bible says over in James chapter 122, the half-brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was saying, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. Uh, so 
The Bible says it's important that we should pray. We should pray without ceasing. It tells us that we ought to pray. That's what the Bible says. Everybody say, be a doer. Be a doer. See, being a doer, not just hearing that we should pray, but, but doing the prayer. We don't always feel like praying. That's why it's called the sacrifice of praise, because we don't always feel like it, but we, we do it. We don't always feel like witnessing. Man, there's times I have not felt like witnessing, but yet I just do the witnessing because you're supposed to be a doer of the word. Be, say doer. It says, be a doer of the word and, and not a hearer only, um, deceiving your own selves. Just hearing it and not doing it, you actually deceive yourselves. You're, you're not getting any stronger by, just hear, by, by, by not doing it. But hearing it is important, but you ought to do it also. Amen? Amen? For if any be a hearer only. Now, he's going to make sure we understand this. James does this, half-brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, uh, but be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. In other words, you can... You can deceive yourselves in thinking, uh, I'm great because uh, I heard. But he says, no, no, be a doer. And in verse 23 it says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, now this is important. He says, if anybody be a hearer of the word and not a doer. So here tonight we're talking about witnessing. We're talking about witnessing. We're talking about the importance of witnessing. And when we leave here, you have heard that. And tomorrow you'll be at work or you'll be at play or you'll be somewhere. You'll be at school. You'll be at college. You'll be somewhere. You'll be at the restaurant. You'll be at the grocery store. You'll be somewhere. And, and be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Amen? Now, I'll tell you, a lot of times, it's, it's amazing over the years, anytime I've ever talked about witnessing, this is the time. I can talk about forgiveness. People, there are certain people over the years that have had problems with talking about forgiveness. I take that back, yeah. But the one I get the most... Flack on is this. Don't make me feel guilty because I'm not witnessing. Don't make me feel bad and throw that at me. You say, really? Yeah, really. As a pastor, that's the number one thing I get beat up on over the years is when I tell people they ought to witness. Can't you say it in a different way? Uh, yeah, you might want to witness. But I think we ought to just say it the way God says it. Amen. He wants us to be a witness. Be a doer of the word and, and, and not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he was like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth away, and straightway he forgets. He, he looks in the glass. Okay, say I look in the glass and I go, boy, <laughs> I got some needs here. But then I walk away and I forget that I have those needs. Someone who hears what you're supposed to do and then doesn't do it, he knows he has the needs and then he walks away and forgets. So when we know we're supposed to witness and we walk away and we don't do, do it, it's like a man looks in the mirror and says, oh, I see some areas I need to work on, but he doesn't do it. In verse 25 of James 1, it says, But whosoever looketh in the perfect law of liberty, the, the law of love, the law of Jesus, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer, everybody say doer, doer, of the work. The work. Notice it doesn't say a doer of the word. It says a doer of the work. There's, we're not saved by our works. The Bible makes it very clear. We're saved by the grace of God. But we are saved for works. So we are supposed to be witnesses for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says, but a doer of the works. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So when you and I decide to be a witnesser, you and I do something serious, and you, God says, you're not just being a hearer, you're actually being a doer, and I'm going to bless you. Amen? Amen? The Bible tells us that we need to go into all the world. Jesus Christ did that. And in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, um, sometimes, and, and most of the time, when people are facing the end of their life, this is when they write a, a book. They know that in a couple of years they may go, so they write a book about their lives and they, they put something in there. They'll write a diary and they'll put things to their kids because they feel their, their life's getting closer to the end. They don't know when they're going to go, but they figure, I'm getting older, it might happen, I want my kids to read these, these are the, the words I want my kids to remember. Or they know they're going to go and they call the family and I have something to say to you. And the family gets around them and, and they say something really profound. I remember my mom, uh, Patsy, you were there, my mom uh, was fighting the good fight of faith, and she was in the hospital. They said she was going to die. They, they called the family, and they told us that she was going to go. Three times they said, she's gone, she's gone, she's gone. 
And so she had heard that, so she called us all in there. She, she gave us all her, her last blessing. I said, Shh, don't do this. She, but it was nice. Now I know what she would say to me on her deathbed, but it wasn't her deathbed. <laughs> but she wasn't sure. She wanted to make sure she knew. You know, she said, Tim, brush your teeth. I, I don't know why she said but <laughs> But it, that was on her deathbed. No. But, but seriously, she said something very important to each one of us. She called each one of us in the room, talked to us, and said what she thought what they were telling her. She's, she's still fighting, but she wanted to make sure that she told us what she thought she wanted to make sure we knew. Amen? So Jesus Christ is getting ready now. He's, he's died on the cross. He's, he's risen. He's now been walking on the earth. Uh, 500 people have already seen him. And he's talked to them, but now he's getting ready to go up. And he says something to his followers. In my estimation, in my thinking, the last things he says may be really, really important. You follow what I'm saying? It'd be like my mom calling us in. It'd be like somebody writing a book thinking it's the last time or a diary. And this is what he says in Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world and preach ye the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all. In other words, this is what he said. Be a doer and not a hearer only. Be a giver and not a receiver only. Be a giver and not a receiver only. We want to be givers. Amen? Amen. So he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Turn to the person next to you and say, say this, I guess you qualify. You're quite a creature. Go ahead. <laughs> it's all right. Hey, hey, they're good. In, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, go ye therefore. And this is a, now these are two, the Holy Spirit used uses Matthew and uses Mark, talking about the same incident, but, but each of them record it so we can see it. And in Mark 28 and 19, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things uh, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. He says, If you'll witness... I'll be there with you. And when God, when Jesus, when his Holy Spirit is with you, this is what he says. He says, when you are witness, when you witness, I am there with you. Think about that. If Jesus is there with me when I'm ministering over here to Rick or witnessing to Rick or if I'm witnessing to Nick or I'm witnessing to Amy or Ben or anyone at all, if I'm witnessing, the Bible says that he's with us when we're witnessing. If Jesus is with me, Jesus is strong. That means I get his strength. I get strength from Jesus. How do I get stronger as a Christian or as a believer? I witness. So when I witness, it, he's there with me, and I get stronger just because of his presence. Amen? Say, I haven't felt the presence of God lately. Well, there's all kinds of things we could tell you to do, to, but one of the things we can say is witness. When you start to witness the presence of God, Jesus says, I will be there with you. If you want his presence, witness for Jesus. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, I'll be talking to you about getting saved after the service. Just go ahead. <laughs> we started talking about getting saved, and Vern got up and walked out. I don't know what's going on. I, <laughs> the Bible says, go into the highways and the hedges. In Luke chapter 14, verse 23, it says this. And the Lord said unto the servant, go ye into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. God wants his house filled. We had some in, in this room right here that have studied what they call church growth. How do you grow a church? How can you make a church really grow? They talk about it, and uh, they say, first of all, one of the great ways is you, you, find, you find an area where the population is growing. That's it's smart to do, you know. You find an area the population is going down, your church may not grow. Uh, so that's one of the things you could do that. But, you know, what they say is the best thing. You say, well, how about radio? How about television? How about computer? How about online? All those things are good. But the number one reason a church grows is that people invite their friends. That means they witness for Jesus Christ. They invite their friends. That's the number one reason churches grow. So I guess you could reverse that and say the number one reason church doesn't grow is because people aren't inviting their friends. If that's true for a local body, it's also tr true for the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that. And he says, go in to the hedges. Go everywhere. 
witness, bring him in. Because the way the church is going to grow is because people witnessing for him. Turn to somebody and say, I should be witnessing. Okay. Jesus equipped us to be uh, witnesses. Uh, he said, I'll make you fishers of men in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He, he, he grabbed them and he taught them so they could teach us. So it wasn't that he grabbed them and taught them and then those were all he ever cared about. He taught them so they could teach us, so they could pass on his teachings to us, so they could write it down and, and record it for us, so they could orally tell each other and pass it down through time. So, so when he says these things, we can say it's only for them, uh, but what he's talking about here, it's not only for them. Now watch this. He says in um, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, uh, Peter is already a fisherman. His relatives are fishermen. They're already fishermen there. But he says, I'm going I'm to relate to you so you understand what I'm talking about. If you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. So we need to pull in the fish. We need to go out and throw the net. We need to draw in the fish. The way a fisherman caught fish back then is he had some work. He had to throw the net out, and then he had to pull the net in. And so what we do is we, we tell somebody about Jesus Christ, we're throwing the net out. And when we, we ask them to receive Jesus Christ, we're pulling the net in. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we get him into the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, uh, the Bible says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And this is important. Why, why was a baptism of the Holy Spirit, why was the, the day of Pentecost so important? Well, there's a lot of reasons the day of Pentecost is important. But let's let the Word of God explain to us uh, what it says here, how important it is about saving people. It says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Now, he wants us to witness for him. He wants us to witness for what he did on the cross for us. He wants us to witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, remember what was taking place. You had Peter. Now, Peter was at times, and I like Peter because I think we can all relate to him at times in our lives, we like Paul because he was so bold. But Peter uh, kind of relates to a lot of us too. Or different times of our life we're bold and other times we're not so bold. And Peter was kind of wishy-washy at times. He, he said, I'll never, you know, I'll, I won't leave you. I'll, I'll die for you. And then all of a sudden he betrayed Jesus three times. And we go, you know, I think I've kind of let God down to myself. And we see Jesus still inviting him back. And so it's a great thing that he did. Amen. So, so, so that's a good thing. But Peter on the day of Pentecost is the one the Holy Ghost, God and Jesus picks to stand up and to give the salvation message. 3,000 people give their hearts to Jesus Christ. So it's somebody who had messed up, who had not at times did everything right. How did he change from not doing things right to all of a sudden it seemed as though, now watch this, it seemed as though he had power. That he had lacked power before, and now all of a sudden it looked as though he had power. It seemed as though over here he was wishy-washy and didn't have power. And over here it looked like he had power. Um, it would be like this uh, fan over here. It has no power right now. So it's sitting there, it's kind of worthless. It has these little blades on it, it's kind of nice looking, but it has no power. But if you plug it into the wall, all of a sudden now it has power and those blades start going around and, and you feel the power of the wind. But it's worthless without power. Well, Peter was without power and he, he, he uh, denied Jesus three times. But on the day of Pentecost, it says here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power after, the Holy Go after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be my witnesses unto me. Now watch this. He says, you're going to receive power, and then you're going to be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the world. I want you to notice that it says here, you shall receive power. Uh, yes, um, speaking in tongues, praying in tongues, I believe in that. I think it's a great, great thing. I pray in tongues myself. I, I, I encourage you to pray in tongues. I think all the gifts of the Spirit are important. I really do. I, 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 we, don't, we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We welcome the Holy Spirit. I, I like a tongue and interpretation and service. I, I like prophecy. I love all that stuff. But, but we have to understand we ought to use that power to witness to other people. Amen? 
We should use that power to witness for other people. We should use that power to witness. It helps them and it strengthens us. It helps them and it strengthens us. It helps them. And that's the original reason for the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so we would have power to carry out the message of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, and to the Jew first, and also unto the Greek. Um, it's, it says that the, the gospel uh, is the power. So we need to use the power of God by witnessing to other people. Now, if you are witnessing, and the power of God comes, so you can witness to Rick over here. Well, I'm witnessing to Rick. The power of God comes on me because so, I now I'm witnessing to him. And while I'm witnessing to Rick, I, get the, I also get blessed because the power of God is here. I come over here and I, I witness to Nick. I start to talking to Nick about Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus. The power of God comes, I get blessed, and, and Nick gets blessed. I go over to Amy, I talk about Jesus Christ, I talk about the Lord. I start witnessing to her about the Lord and Savior Jesus. While I'm witnessing to her, the power of God comes, I get strengthened, and she gets strengthened. I get strengthened in my own faith while I'm witnessing to Amy, or I'm witnessing to Nick, or I'm witnessing to Rick. That's what happens to us. Amen? Amen. So if we want to get strong, how to strengthen ourselves as a believer? Yeah, read the Word of God. For sure, we ought, to, we ought to pray. Of course, we ought to confess the right thing. We should be givers, and we should have Christian service. But we ought to be witnessers. Witness. Good news, church. Witness, 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 witness. We need to talk to people at work about our walk with our Lord and Savior. And again, you don't have to have a, have to have a perfect life and complete theological knowledge to witness to somebody about Jesus Christ. Just talk to them about you and your relationship with Jesus, and you'll feel the power of the Holy Spirit come on you, and, and, and it'll be, it'll be uh, good for them and you. Amen? Uh, what does God want? You know, that's when it all gets down to I preached a sermon, um, I don't know, several years ago. I might preach it again sometime. Uh, what makes God smile? What makes God smile? You know, sometimes we think this, we think that. We're here. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, talking about God, who would have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. I think that'd make God smile when you and I witnessing, because he wants all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So when you and I witness, I think it makes God smile. I like to bring a smile to Dad's face. A Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, it says this. It's the Old Testament but notice what it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. He who winneth souls is wise. Witnessing strengthens us, helps build the church of God, and brings someone from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And when we do that, we ourselves get so blessed. I'm, I'm going to be doing a wedding ceremony after this in this room. And uh, we're just going to have it. And, and I'm so happy that when I first met these people, they weren't really believers. And now they're believers. And I'm so glad that someone witnessed to them <coughs> about Jesus Christ. Isn't it nice? to know that somebody knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Isn't it nice to know they came from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Isn't it nice? And think about this. Wouldn't it be nice if you, Nick, was the one that led them to the Lord? Or you, Patty, you led them to the Lord? You led your sister to the Lord? You, you finally got her saved after all these years? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if people in Florida got saved? Wouldn't it be nice if... <laughs> In Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 14, in the New Living Translation, it said, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him, meaning Jesus Christ, Again, it says, anyone who calls on his name shall be saved. But how can they call on him 
to save them from hell and destruction and eternity and damnation unless they believe in him. And how shall they believe in him if they've never heard about him? Or they've heard the wrong things about him. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Witnessing makes the church of God stronger. Witnessing makes the person you witness to when they receive Jesus Christ a lot stronger. My friend, witnessing makes you stronger. It's one of the areas Satan wants to shut your mouth the most. You can talk about other things. You can talk about your, what you eat. You can talk about the car you drive. You can talk about the person that you're married to or the person that you're dating. You can talk about some new health craze. You can talk about some dye you're using for your hair or some liposuction you just went through. Uh, but the devil, he won't let you talk about salvation. He doesn't want you to. He'll try to get you not to. And here we have a whole world longing to hear how do I turn my life around? When I first got saved, I witnessed by telling everybody they're going to hell. That wasn't too good. I talked to all my friends about Jesus Christ. I was a witnessing a nut. Um, I went to work. I told everybody about Jesus Christ. I witnessed, I witnessed, I witnessed. I turned some of the people off. Some of them ran from me and from God, but I was trying. I didn't have a whole lot of wisdom. I had a whole lot of zeal. Um, but as years went by, most of and almost all of those close friends of mine that I had witnessed to would call me on the phone. Hey, Tim, what? Talk to me about this. And we talked about Jesus Christ. And I was able to lead a lot, if not all, most all of them to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I was made fun of and mocked and put down and, and ridiculed by them at first. I only tell you that not to blow my own horn because there's not too much of a horn to blow. All I'm saying is that you may be made fun of, put down, mocked, but that's okay. Just gut it out because in a year or two years or three years or four years, you may get a phone call. And they may say, can you talk to me about that again? And they may be looking for an answer because we know we're not perfect. We know there's an eternity somewhere. We know that we can't pay the price for our own mistakes. And we don't really know what to do about it. And we try to act all proud and cocky and assured of ourselves. But in our heart of hearts, the world knows they need an answer. Those who reject and come against Christianity the most, they need us to talk to them about Jesus Christ. Let them mock us, make fun of us, put us down, ridicule us. But then one day the phone will ring. And they'll say, I received Jesus. Or you planted a seed and somebody else watered and God gave the increase. And I'm in the kingdom of God. It's worth it. In the meantime, by you witnessing, you got stronger. Amen? You got stronger. So let's get stronger. Let's read the word of God for sure. We need to do that. We need to pray. Yes, definitely pray. Confess Jesus is your Lord. Confess you're in the kingdom of God. Confess your sins are forgiven. Confess that you're right with God. Confess that you're saved by grace. And confess if you make a mistake, God has forgiven you. Confess that for sure. Confess, 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 confess. Give and serve God. Find a place to serve God for sure. Witness. Witness. Witness for Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask Arch, who's half asleep. Uh, I, he's not acting asleep. I don't mean to say that that way. The reason I'm saying is he went with the youth for their uh, getaway. And I was talking to him before the service in my office. He said, you know, Pastor, I'm just kind of tired. And, and I said, yeah, I understand that. Because he's been gone. It was a glorious time. Arch, can you just talk to us for a moment, okay, about if I was going to lead somebody to the Lord, how I would do it? In fact... Why don't we have an example there? Right over there is uh, uh, Matthew Schuster. Matthew, why don't you stand up if you would, please? 
Matthew is saved. Matthew's a man of God. Matthew's a good quality individual. But he's going to play the role of somebody who's not saved right now. And you're going to talk to him. You're just going to witness. How would you start it? Now, you're at work. Okay? You guys are working together. How, just give us an idea how you would go into it. How are you doing today, Matthew? <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> All right. That's good to hear. But you know how you can really feel more than tremendous. No. Well, because I know Jesus, and he saved me from all of my sins, and even death. So I would encourage you, if you like, and accept him as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> oh man! <Easy. laughs> oh Lord, let it be that easy. Let it be that easy. Well, God is good. Well, so. you're good. You are God good. God is good. Yeah, God you're good. good. <laughs> Can you hand that over to Matthew? No, no, the other Matthew in front of you, Matt. Matthew, can you, can you stand up, if you would, please? Now, your wife over there, uh, we really don't know if she's safe. She's been coming here a long time, you know, but we're not sure. So uh, these are just people who who don't know we're going to talk about this, but I know that this man is someone who loves the Lord. I know that this is someone who knows the Lord. They may sound like they're stumbling through it, and, and it's kind of good if it does, because then we know that we're all the same. We may stumble through this, but God will help us. Amen? There's nothing to be embarrassed about. I, listen, I chased most of my friends away from God instead of drawing them to God. I really did, because I went about it the wrong way, but God still used some of it, and, and they ended up coming back. Matthew, if uh, you're going to talk to your wife over there, say you, you met her over there in Chile, you know, now, I know she was a saved Christian over there in Chile, but let's say she's, she's not saved. How, would, how could you approach it? Give us an idea. Honey, I know we've been together for about 15 years now, but it's time to ante up and accept the Lord as your personal <laughs> Savior. Because if you stay a heathen, we can't stay married. <laughs> oh, that, that might work. But how, come, how come she just put her mouth over her hand over her mouth? She still won't receive. She's a Go ahead, Matthew. Give us an idea how you might approach somebody. Seriously. I would say, may I ask you a question? They say, sure. Or they look at me like I was a weirdo. And I'd say, if you were to die today, and you stood before God, and he asked you one simple question, and that question being, why should I let you in to my kingdom, to my heaven? The most common answer would probably be something along the lines of, I've done this, I've done that, I've given here, I've given there. I've loved down people. And then the Lord will come back to you and say, well, my son died for you. You never knew him. He reached out to you. In fact, he knocked on the door of your heart, but there was only a handle on the inside because he wasn't going to force his way in. But he was there and he was knocking and for whatever reason, you just didn't want to let him in. So how do you want to change that? Uh, if you're talking to me, yes, I do. <laughs> if you're talking to your wife, sorry. Thank you, Matthew. Can you pass that over to Vern? I would like to hear somebody who's not saved explain to us how to get saved. Amen. Vern, could you please stand up? Now, Vern, you're one of the people that I know has studied, uh, and, and if I'm wrong, you can correct me publicly, I don't care. Um, I think you're one of those who have studied, who have read how to grow churches, and the most effective way to grow a church is from people inviting their friends, is that right? Yeah, like you talked about before, about 15% of the people that come to church and stay in church is from all the advertising and all the media and all those different things, and ads and all of that, but about 85% of the people who come to church and stay in church was invited by a friend, a relative, co-worker. Yeah, how many in this room, now, now don't raise your hand if you really don't, because we're trying to get a percentage idea here, okay? How many here watch Christian TV a lot? No, no okay. Vern, just get an idea. You know, get, get that. Now the reason I'm saying that is we're Christians, we're believers, and a lot of people don't watch Christian TV a lot. And we're believers. So when we sit around thinking, well, Christian TV is going to win everyone into the kingdom of God, it's going to win people in, but we're the ones that need to bring it to people. Amen? Because they'll be watching NBC, CBS, HBO, Showtime, 
I sent a, a sin on Max. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be watching all that stuff and what they really need is someone coming along because there's Christian TV does a great job I'm so happy some obviously you always have a problem with some but thank God for them I've been blessed tremendously by Christian TV there's times that man I, I tell you you know you get hit between the eye with a ball hammer or whatever they call it and you turn on something and someone's on there ministering the word and you go I just ministered that myself you know, a month ago, but I need to hear it right now. So I thank God for Christian TV. I, I'm not mocking. I'm not making fun. But unfortunately, not every unbeliever goes home and goes, gee, I think we'll turn on Christian TV tonight. They're going to watch HBO, something like that. They're going to watch sports. They're going to watch something. But when they get to work, they have to listen to you. So Vern, kind of the percentage we're talking about on why people would come to church might be the same percentage on why people would receive Jesus Christ. Do you have any statistic for us there? They did, a, they did a study not too many years ago, and they said 25% of the unsaved people, if they were going to go to a church, um, it would be if they were invited by, you know, again, friend, relative, co-worker. So 25% of the unsaved people are open to invitations, and it'd be the number one way that they would come to a church would be by invitation. So if they come to a church, how much more do they need to hear us invite them to Jesus Christ? Amen. Now, you just heard Arch over there, who, who admittedly said he's tired tonight, and, and uh, he did a great job witnessing to Matthew. And uh, then Matthew stood up and gave us another way of approaching it, which was fantastic, I thought. And then Vern just gave us some statistics. And so we understand how important it is. It really is. And, and none of them were perfect. I mean, perfectly great with me, but I mean, none of them, I'm sure, did it absolutely perfect. But they did it. Amen? They did it. Okay, if you were witnessing to uh, Gary and he wasn't saved, go ahead. Um, I'll, I usually start with uh, my experience or something along that line. So I'll tell him, you know, I, we have a conversation. Just, just do a, it. Don't talk about it. conversation today. It's like, uh, you know, I did life. We were talking about something. I said, you know, well, I did life the hard way. Wait, hold on. Right. I just want you to do it. Don't talk about how you did yeah. it, okay? Well, I did life the hard way. I did 13 years drug and alcohol abuse, you know, on and on in my story of, of things that I went through in life and then talk with them about, I don't know where you're exactly at with Jesus and stuff and, and, and have a conversation with them uh, concerning that. And just three hours ago, just had that kind of a conversation with someone. Uh, well, have it with him, would you? <laughs> Please. Because, Ger- Vern, yeah. I've heard you. Yeah. I'm asking you to have that conversation. I talk about because I know how effective it can be. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I did life the hard way. I went the, the wrong route, the hard route. I did 13 years of drug and alcohol abuse and heroin shooting and cocaine shooting and collecting money for an attorney and stolen cars and all this stuff and uh, lived life in the fast lane and, and did things. And by the grace of God, I, I was saved and came to know Jesus. And I haven't had a drug or drink in over 33 years and no more trouble with the law or any of those kind of things. And uh, Jesus completely saved me from long-term imprisonment or death. And I don't know where you're at and where, who Jesus is to you, but uh, Jesus completely revolutionized my life. And I would encourage you that, uh, y- you know, where are you at right now? What's, who's Jesus to you? And then let them decide what they're going to say or talk and then work from there. Yeah, there, there was a vitamin company on television, for, and that, that's why I wanted him to talk. There was a vitamin guy, uh, Herbal Life. He was very popular at one time. He's a really, I think he's still around. I don't know. But I was watching him on TV. I've said this before. And he had all these guys come up and talk about the vitamins. They said this vitamin, blah, 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 this vitamin, blah, blah, blah. And it was really informative and it was really knowledgeable, these people. And it was really scientific and it was really over most of our heads. But we sometimes you got what they're talking about. Other times it, it was really over the, the normal man's head. But then the main guy, the guy that was the billionaire, the guy that made all the money, the guy that started the company, the guy that got all these people working for him, the guy whose television program it was, he came up and took the microphone and says, now I want to tell you, all this was, in, this was really good information for you to have, but let me tell you how you get people to become Herbalite uh, people. You tell them what it did for you. When you tell them what the vitamin did for you, that's really what they want to know. You give all the scientific stuff, that's nice. But if you say, I took this and it changed my health. I took this and I lost weight. I took this and all of a sudden, he said, that's how, and I sat there and listened to that and I shouted out loud in the room, that's how we're supposed to witness. 
Amen? Of course it's good to know all the spiritual laws. Of course it's good to know all this and all that. But really, Nick, the big thing is for me to look at you and say, Nick, I want to tell you something. What happened to me, Nick, is I, I was miserable on the inside. I thought I was happy on the outside, but I realized I wasn't. And I really was searching. And then I found Jesus Christ. And when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I had inner peace. And it really, really honestly happened to me. It, it changed me. It changed the way I thought about things and what I found was important, what wasn't important. And that's what people need to hear. So for you that want to witness, Arch, Matt, Vern, do we have anyone else witness? Whoever. Thank you. Thank everyone. But remember, the way to do it is just tell them what happened to you. Amen? Heavenly Father, in the, thank you, Vern. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we love you so much. Father, we're not ashamed of your word. We're not ashamed to pray. We're not ashamed to confess what you've done for us in our life, that you are our God. It's an honor to give to you, Father, and it's a, certainly an honor to serve you. It's not ever, never, never, never a pain. It's always a privilege to serve you. Though the enemy tries to tell us it's a pain, it is a privilege to serve you. And Father, please use us. Use our mouths and use our life. Use us to bring people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Help us to say the right things. Let us be effective for your kingdom. And we do thank you for Christian TV. And we even thank you for all the churches that are on this world, and especially those that are teaching the gospel. But Heavenly Father, we realize that the church... Your kingdom grows by us witnessing. Help us witness. Open up doors for us to witness. Bring people into our lives so we can witness. Let today be a day of witness for us. And I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you, uh, uh, Matthew. Thank you, Arch. Thank you, Vernon. God bless you, buddy. God bless all of you. May the Lord bless you. And please find somebody to witness to. Uh, in this room tonight, afterwards, we're going to do a, a, a renewal of, of vows for somebody, a, a wedding. So we're going to ask you to clear the room out pretty soon. But first, I have my wife who's going to walk in here. And uh, Audrey, could you please stand? It's her birthday. Audrey, could you please stand? Why don't you walk it back to her? Walk it back to her, if you would, please, okay? Let's sing happy birthday to Audrey. Happy birthday.